the book is dedicated to two people. One of them is Eddie, actually, because frankly, between you and me, there was an injustice in this world. This is a book that Eddie should have written. Um, and the other person is Laura Pripstein, who's been someone I grew up with and still a close friend. And she, when I saw the it, she was like, oh, you ever heard of Scott Milk Gross? And I said, no. And she said, oh, because we used to have this book, a nice baby, and it was hilarious. And me and my brother, she said, when she was a little kid, they would read this book and just laugh at the accents and laugh because the parents were always hitting the kids and they thought that was hilarious. Um, it turns out she was right. Um, but uh, so I started thinking, so I was like, oh, thanks, Laura, that's cool. And I just didn't really think about it for a couple of years. And then in the span of like three or four months, Milk Rose's name popped up in a couple of different places. I was doing a lot of reading about early cartoons and, and um, uh, graphic novels and those kinds of things. I was working at the American Jewish Historical Society. And, um, and his name kept coming up. And, and so I emailed Eddie, actually. And I was like, hey, what do you know about this guy? And Eddie said, oh, this is not employing me some things on the internet. And, um, you know, a couple other people. And, and um, after speaking with Hasse Diner, who is, was my dissertation advisor and still is a, a close friend and advisor in general in, in all kinds of things, um, she was like, oh, you should write a book. Um, this seems like a good book. So, uh, so I started working on it, and that's how, uh, that's how it started. But it was really like an interest sort of the phenomenon before I really knew the books. And then when I actually got to read the books, it got much better. Right. But what's, what's interesting about them the, is our mission is this very thick you know, dialect, and when you first read it, it's, it's actually difficult to read it. It's difficult to understand. Um, you know, for those of you who, have, who haven't heard it, uh, Willing to read a little? I'll, I'll pick a, a thing, but will you tell them what you do in your Yiddish class? Right, yeah, I will. I will. Um, I, uh, one of the things that I do is I teach uh, Yiddish language at Rutgers, and uh, uh, in a language class, one of the things you have to work on is accents. And uh, before I actually get the students into learning the language, I have them read Milt Gross uh, just to practice their own accents in Yiddish, because this is kind of, if, if you develop a, a Yiddish accent, a decent Yiddish accent in English, uh, it's easier to, tra it translates easier to using it in Yiddish as well. Um, and I usually start them off reading uh, Milk Gross's parody of a girl on post a raven, which almost everybody knows, uh, and it's, you know, quite a, quite a funny parody. Uh, so I, I found, you know, Milk Gross to be, you know, really useful in, uh, in that respect, uh, just in, in, in using it for uh, my class. So you want to give it a try? Sure. But, uh, well, you know, are there any professional actors that might want to give this a try? <laughs> no. This is not my strong suit. And I just noticed that the, 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 the <laughs> press. There's a reference in here to uh, Peaches Heenan, who, um, uh, she, was, um, she was a child bride in the 20s, in the late 20s, and it was a very well public, publicized case. She married, so she was like 13, and she married this guy who was like 51. Um, and then they got divorced and it was in all the tabloids. It was a very big case. Um, and he references it here. It's this really obscure reference. And actually, I, I made the, there's supposed to be a footnote that the press forgot to put in about the pages here. But it'd be like, like 40 or 50 years from now, like mentioning something from Jersey Shore. <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, Jersey Shore's going to have residents. <laughs> We're still talking about Peaches Heenan, so you never know. This is going to be bad, so bear with me. Um, despite the fact that I think Gross reads best aloud, I, I, I've never read it in front of an audience. Actually, until Friday night, Friday night, I had to, and that was bad too. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, the Raven. The Raven. Uh, uh, the subtitle is Give a Look is in the Raven. Once upon a midnight dreary, well, I've had a tabloid cheery, pictures in and getting leery, other pictures on page four. Gradually came a wecking, ta da, fighter bomb is smacking, with a razor strap shellacking, good for nothing, Isidore. <laughs> Smacks him where he pants is lacking, in the rear from Isidore, which has happened oft before. <laughs> that's it, that's it, that's it. Nice, 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 nice. But this is an interesting throwback to a culture that no longer really exists, a uh, sort of inter-family public reading. Uh, you know, dozens and dozens of books were published uh, from the turn of the 20th century uh, in which uh, people, you know, they give people poems and songs and uh, speeches to read that were read in front of families. And you, know, you have to remember that there's a time before television, radio, uh, you know, the only media 
is print media, and you know, performance within people's homes was uh, tended to be a very common thing. So this is something that I think really, uh, really reflects that. Yeah, there, there's elocution manuals that kids had to do in school, and particularly for immigrant groups. Um, the idea that they would learn to speak English. Alfred Kaysen speaks very really strongly about this in his memoir, Walk in the City, where um, he was always afraid that his Jewish accent, his immigrant accent, kind of gave him away as a Jew. So the, um, the, the elocution books were there designed, and they were always, always included these kind of famous works of literature that you would learn to declaim with the proper English accent, whatever that might mean here in New York City. Um, and um, almost as soon as the, the, the elocution books came out, people started putting out parody elocution books, not with accents, but with like dirty lyrics and so on. Um, uh, so the gross stuff is the poetry that he, that he does. He does, he does Hiawatha, he does The Raven, um, he does them for Christmas, and um, uh, uh, Paul Revere's Ride. Um, the, the poetry stuff is, really comes out of the parody tradition, um, but it sort of flips the it even flips the parody on its head by not only making fun of the stories of the poems, which is what the regular English parody elocution books do, but it actually makes it makes the readers read it in the prop in the accents that the original parody books were trying to train the readers out of. Um, and I just think that's terrific. Like that just shows me some like that he pulls that off um, in a way that was so popular and successful um, is like genius. Right. Well, I think one of the things that made it so resonant was fact that everyone had read these things and you know they all knew them so, so it, was, it was easy to understand what was happening. Yeah. Even, even this thick dialogue. Yeah and it's not like he's doing like uh, you know Ezra Pound poems or anything. Like these are poems that have very not only a very uh, strict meter but a really like a meter that you know from the very beginning. Like if I was gonna do Hiawatha I'd sort of clapped out the rhythm of Hiawatha. Right, that's the, that's the meter of Hiawatha, which is very intentional on Wadsworth's part. But um, for once you see that, you, you know what you're supposed to hear, and then you hear this totally different thing in an accent that's all wrong. Um, and it just it shows somebody, and the reason that I got into it is because I, um, uh, like I said, I wrote this book about radio, and I've always been interested in oral culture, audio culture. And what got me first, what really turned me on to go to the very beginning when I started reading the books was, was how oral the phenomenon of milk gross is, oral, A-U-R-A-L. Um, that it really is part of this oral culture of the 1920s, when radio was beginning to take off, when film started being able to speak in 1927, um, and these, the, the sort of prehistory of these elocution books that I was talking about where people would perform these poems, and that it is really oral, but you only, the parody stuff you only get if you know the original, that's the, like, that's the beauty of parody. I found was, uh, was um, I think it was from McCall's or something like that, a, a detective story that he writes. Um, and it's written in like really classic, sort of Dashiell Hammett style, hard boiled detective lingo. And it's really, um, it's pretty funny um, to read that because uh, it would get, I mean, it just showed his, his ear for accent place, language, and for the kind of details of communication. So I think growing up in a bilingual household really. Benefit him. I don't think he spoke with an accent. Uh, he was born here in the United States. Uh, his parents clearly did. Um, but uh, but his ability to hear the differences and then mimic them was so striking to me. So this McCall's piece, where it's like straight out of like yeah, it's straight out of like pulp hardwell fiction, was like oh, this is not just a guy who's kind of playing on his background, his Jewish background, his his, his neighborhood, but he really understands uh, how people write and how people speak and how people listen in this really, um, uh, really canny way. Right. And so I think growing up in New York just gave him access to all of these accents. Right, so there's this real sense that, uh, you know, in relation to this audio culture more than almost the other years. It's a combination of audio and visual, but it's, you know, the audio plays a more significant role. Yeah. Um, 